okay, 1.2 is mass spectroscopy. The outcome is I can explain the quantitative relationship between the mass spectrum of an element and the masses of the element's isotopes. So let's start out with just a little bit of review of isotopes here. So if we look at the copper, say, in a penny, uh, we would see that not all of the atoms are the same. Some is copper 63 and some is copper 65. So the difference between them is that they have different numbers of neutrons in their nuclei. So what is the approximate percentage? Uh, about 30% is copper 65 and 70% is copper 63. So when we look at the average atomic mass of copper on the periodic table, uh, we see that this value is closer to 63 AMU. And that makes sense because the 63 AMU are more abundant, so they're going to have more impact on the average mass. So looking at this data, let's find the average atomic mass of neon. How do we know if we did it right? So I just want to take the percent abundance and change it into a decimal, uh, into its fractional abundance by dividing by 100. So I did 90.48 divided by 100, and then I multiplied that by the mass of the isotope. So for this one, it's 20. I did that for all three isotopes and got the total here. And if we look on the periodic table, we see that the molar mass of neon matches this value. So we know we did it right. Now number five is a little bit tricky, but you have to realize here that you're trying to solve for two things. You're trying to solve for percent of calcium uh, 40 and then percent of calcium 46. So anytime you're trying to solve for two things, that usually means two equations. So you're going to solve this using a system of equations. So for the percents, we're going to let x be the fractional percent of calcium 40. Uh, and y be the fractional percent of um, calcium 46. So I know that if I add x and y, uh, that should equal 1, or if I add x and y as percents, it should equal 100%. I also know that I need to multiply that decimal percent by the mass for each of these in order to get the average. So I'm going to rearrange this equation to solve for y and then I'm going to plug y into my equation. Now I have my equation in one term with one variable, so I can solve for x. So I'm going to do my multiplication here, and then I'm going to distribute here. So I'm going to do 1 times 45.95 and negative x times 45.95. So with a little bit of rearranging, combining like terms, we end up with 0.65. Uh, so that means that uh, the fractional percent is uh, much closer to 40, uh, the mass of 40. We've got 65.3% for x, and we can subtract uh, from 100 to get the percent for y. Um, and this makes sense because the average mass is closer to the mass of 40 than it is to 46. This last question here, we just have uh, comparing the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in neutral atoms of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So they have the same number of protons because they're both chlorine, but their mass numbers are different because chlorine 37 has two more neutrons than chlorine 35. And they're both neutral, so the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. So that was just a quick review of isotopes and a little bit of atomic structure. So let's talk about um, a mass spectrometer. So this is a um, analytical tool that lets us separate atoms, isotopes, or fragments of molecules based on mass. So this helps us to understand the structure of atoms, isotopes, slash fragments. So this is used um, very simply for isotopes like we're going to study, but in more advanced applications, we could even use this to break up a, a large organic molecule, and based on the masses of the fragments, we can ascertain uh, what the structure of the molecule is. Uh, so 
uh, which of Dalton's atomic theory statements are inaccurate and why. So we know now that atoms of a given element are not all identical. So like carbon 12 and carbon 13 are both carbon, but they aren't identical. Uh, atoms can be subdivided into protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, but generally, breaking apart nuclei is the type of thing that happens during fission and fusion, so under nuclear chemistry. So those are very extreme conditions like you would find, say, on the sun. Um, and we're not too likely to encounter those conditions here on Earth um, unless we have a hadron collider or something like that. Uh, describe the main components of a mass spectrometer. How does the sample move through to reach the detector? So the first chamber is an ionizer. Basically, it fires electrons at the sample, and that knocks off some electrons uh, from those atoms and turns them into positive ions. Uh, next, those cations are subjected to an electric field and a magnetic field. So the magnetic field is going to deflect the cations as they move through it based on their mass. So things that are heavier will have less deflection than things that are lighter. Then there's a sensor and a detector. And basically all you need to understand here is that this produces a signal based on where the ions hit the detector, again, based on their mass, which your computer will analyze and will spit out data for you. So the next question here is asking about uh, deflecting the path of a cannonball versus a tennis ball. So the size of the particle affects how much it can be deflected. The water jet is like the magnetic field and the atoms of various sizes are like the bowling ball and the tennis ball. So the lighter particle will be deflected more. Just like how with your water jet, you can more easily deflect the path of a tennis ball than a bowling ball. So what is the relationship between number and relative height of the peaks? Each peak represents an isotope of the element, which has a different mass. The height of the peak is related to the abundance of each type of isotope. In question eight, uh, we're looking at the mass spectrum for lithium. And we see that uh, there's two isotopes from two peaks, and we see that the peak at uh, 7 AMU is way more abundant than the peak at 6 AMU. So based on this relative abundance and the mass of these isotopes, I would guess that the average is going to be pretty close to 7, but a tiny bit lighter due to some of the uh, lithium-6 isotopes driving down the average mass. So I would say about 6.8 or 6.9 AMU. So what we want to do now is actually calculate uh, the mass here from a mass spectrum. Uh, so this is showing us relative intensity, which means that if we want the percent, we got to take each individual intensity over the total intensity. So the total intensity is 108. So for the 6 AMU, 8 over 108 gives me 7.41%. And for 7 AMU, the intensity is 100. So that gives me 92.59%. Uh, and then doing my math here, I see that my uh, mass is about 6.9. So how does the data from mass spectroscopy does that support or contradict Dalton's early model of the atom. So it contradicts it. It shows that atoms of the same element are not identical. There are different masses due to isotopes. Uh, how does mass spec uh, support the existence of isotopes? We know that those atoms have different masses because they are deflected to a different degree by the magnetic field. So mass spectroscopy lets us separate the atoms based on their different properties. Now the next question here is talking about binding energy. So if you try to push together a bunch of protons, they're going to repel each other. So in order to overcome that repulsion, I'm going to need some energy to push those particles together. So where does that energy come from? when an atom is being forged or created. Uh, it comes from some of the mass. 
So some of that mass has been changed into energy to glue together that nucleus. And we know that there is a relationship between energy and mass uh, from E equals mc squared. So let's think about boron here. The average atomic mass for boron is uh, going to be 10.81 AMU. So based on those two isotopes, I'm going to guess that uh, boron 11 must be more abundant because the average is closer to 11 than it is to 10. So I just estimated here, I did about 90 and 10% because I think that would give me about 10.8 or 10.9. Uh, and then I just made a quick graph here um, sketching the relative abundance mass charge ratio. So I made the uh, MS diagram here for boron. Taking a look at strontium, there's four peaks. So here's my uh, sketched diagram here. Notice that the relative height of these, the 841 is much smaller than 86 and 87 are kind of close, but uh, 88 is way higher. So first I wanna convert uh, the relative intensities into percentages. So I did that here. Now I wanna solve for the average atomic mass, and this is what I get. So this match, matches what we see on the periodic table. So how can data from mass spec be used to identify the masses of individual atoms of an element? So that data is just showing us how many atoms have a specific mass using a magnetic field to deflect the atoms based on their size. So how has mass spec advanced our understanding of the atom? Uh, well, we know that we have isotopes, and we know that each atom of an element is not identical, uh, but they can be slightly different due to things like the number of neutrons. Your reflection questions, how does a mass spectrometer separate atoms? So there's a couple of questions that went over the process. Um, how can I use it to identify isotopes and the relative abundance of the isotopes? That's literally what you did in question 14. You use this mass spec, this data, to get uh, relative intensity and then to get our average atomic mass. So how is mass spec used to determine the average atomic mass of an element? Again, it's exactly what you did in question 14. We convert those relative intensities to percents and then we can solve for our average atomic mass.